Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Christian Lehman Church. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, my name is Caitlin, and I'm on staff here at CLC. And from all of us, we just want to say welcome and good morning. And gosh, it's such a beautiful day, isn't it? Just the sun's out, and it's just the perfect opportunity for us to get together and to worship, to praise God, to fellowship, to dive into his word as one church family this morning. And I know I'm just imagining all of your beautiful, smiling faces. I, I do hope soon, very soon, uh, we can gather together again in person for church. But until then, we'll have to make do with what we've got. And we praise God that we've been able to do this for a year and a half now. Um, but with that being said, please greet one another in the comment section uh, on Facebook. Say hello. Let your kids go on there. We just want to um, just make sure everyone is seen and heard and loved this morning. Um, and yeah, if you're new or visiting, uh, again, we welcome you. Uh, we would love to get to know you better. We'd love to hear your story and see where you could get plugged into our church. And so if that's you, let us know that you're a first time visitor or a guest um, and someone from the staff team will contact you later on this week. Now, I know uh, for those of us who regularly attend CLC, we've known that the last few weeks have been uh, different. There, there have been a lot of different emotions, maybe, and, and transitions. Um, new staff members coming on board and saying goodbye to some old staff members. Um, lots of transitions happening. And for me, I don't know about you, but I, I'm someone who doesn't necessarily uh, like change that much. It, it kind of freaks me out sometimes. Um, but as I was thinking about it more and... Uh, from the wise words of one of our fellow pastors, transitions are always happening. We're always in a constant season of transition, whether it's our own or someone else's. Um, life is uncertain. Things happen that we don't expect. High school students are graduating and going to uh, college and, and people are just, are constantly moving. And I know that for some of us, if you're like me, that change can be really scary and that change can be really daunting. But what I was reminded of at our prayer meeting yesterday was that God is faithful. When everything around us is constantly moving, constantly changing, our God is the one who is constant in the storm. He's the one who always provides, always faithful. And we have this confidence and assurance we have this hope that never wavers, that we can find joy in because of him, because of he who is faithful, because of what he has done for all of us and what he promises to continue to do in our lives. And so I just, I pray that that's an encouragement for all of us at CLC and no matter uh, what you're going through, that, that um, we can always look to the one who is sovereign, one who is constant. So this morning, I, I invite you to just declare that and, and rest in that, rest in that security of who the Lord is. Um, and I just pray that as we sing songs, that we would give him all of the glory, the honor, and the praise that he's due to thank him for what he has done in our lives. So let me pray for us to start, but I invite you to uh, just posture yourselves in, in a way that would, um, I guess, welcome <laughs> welcome the Lord in your homes. I know it could be different. Uh, maybe get away from the snacks and the, and the pantries or your breakfast. But maybe it's kneeling. Maybe it's standing. Maybe it's actually singing out loud this time. But I, I invite you to open up your hearts for whatever God is going to do this morning. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful and you are good and that you are constant and gracious and loving and kind and the list goes on and on, Lord. We thank you that we can see you in little moments, that there are God sightings all over our, our lives if we choose to see it that way, that you are always working for us, going before, preparing our steps, Lord. And so in any season of life, 
in any uncertainty, in any transition, we have hope and confidence and assurance in who you are and what you have done. Lord, we pray this morning that as we worship, you would be with us, that we would feel your presence close, Lord, and um, that you would receive all of the glory this morning. We love you so much, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing.
this be our prayer for every single person in the church this morning, that we would be more and more like Jesus every day, looking to his example of what he has done as he came to the world as a baby, as a servant, humbled to the point of death on a cross, giving his life for us. Let's do that. Let's become more and more like Jesus.
last time. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much once again for who you are and what you've done. We are so unworthy of your love, of your grace, of your mercy, and yet still you sent your son Jesus to the cross. <laughs> you sent Jesus to the cross and he took on the form of a servant. He gave up everything out of love for us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that as followers of Jesus, we would look at that example and we would not go one day unchanged by it. I pray, Lord, that looking at what Jesus did, that we would be transformed in the way that we live our lives, the way that we love people, the way that we interact with people at church, the way that we cross the street and look at our neighbors. Lord, I pray that that would change everything and that your love would be the foundation. Um, of how we choose to live and how we are your light in the world, Lord. We thank you for the, for the reminder of who you are, what you have done. We pray that you continue to speak to us, continue to teach us this morning. Um, we love you so much, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Now for community life, take it away, Denny. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, good morning, CLC. Hope everyone is doing well. As you can tell from my festive background, uh, we are in a season of graduations for our high schoolers, our middle schoolers, and yes, of course, our sixth grade promotion ease. Um, on behalf of Community Life and uh, everyone here on the CLC Sunday team, wishing all the graduates a congratulations and hope you and your families have um, this as a moment uh, for little milestones to celebrate. I know Zoom has not been easy. Uh, and so with that, um, congratulations. Uh, simply put, the mission statement here at CLC is to make disciples who love God, love people, and who seek to serve the world. One way that we seek to do that is connecting with you. Uh, if this is your first time joining us uh, for Sunday service, uh, we'd love to get to know you. Simply reach us at www.christianlayman.org forward slash contact or at info at christianlayman.org. We'd love to get to know you and your family. And we'd love to just really be able to, uh, to bring it here at CLC uh, and show you what we're all about. If, you, if you've been with us here before, you know that each and every week, I like to have a question of the week, uh, but for this week's connect with us in the comment section, uh, give a quick shout out to all our uh, graduation uh, uh, ease. I don't even know what that, how you call someone uh, who's graduating, but for those people out there uh, in the comment section, flood them with a little bit of support and a little bit of love from our CLC family. All right, so today we have a lot of announcements coming your way. So saddle up because I'm about to get hoarse. Uh, today is a communion day. And with that, Pastor Eric will be leading us through a time of remembrance. And as the saying always goes for me, um, Make sure to go on ahead and get that bread because today is a communion day and definitely don't forget the wine and juice. Today is also uh, the CLC annual meeting. This will be taking place right after service an hour after, so not right after, but at 1 p.m. Be a time to hear about the um, changes here at CLC, um, the wins and just uh, the different things that you can expect here from our CLC community. We'll hear, hear a little bit from our board um, and also, you know, just get plugged in and see what we're all about. Uh, definitely check it out at 1 p.m. We'll see you there. Uh, next Saturday is the long awaited June fellowship hike. Um, it will be led by our very own Helen and, uh, you know, definitely check it out. Uh, please RSVP with Pastor Ben or Milton. Uh, basically, anything that you hike next Saturday, you're going to gain it back with the feast that Milton always prepares for us with Julia. Um, as someone who has experienced this before, 
is way, uh, is so much love and so much food um, and just all that in the context of being with your CLC family. So definitely check that out, bring your mask and we'll see you on the hills. Today is also a very special day. Uh, we will be having a baptism uh, of our very own young adult, Justin Ye. Uh, he uh, will be in a pool, but this time without goggles, as you can see here. Um, Pastor Ben uh, will be baptizing Justin right after service. Make sure to stick around to support um, and we'll hear uh, Justin's testimony in a little bit um, later in the service today. Definitely check it out. And lastly, um, you know, as Caitlin was saying, um, this is a season of, you know, changes in our CLC staff. And with that, um, we cannot forget our very own Cecil. Uh, we're very grateful for him and all that he's done for our children's ministry and loving and coming alongside all our families here at CLC. So in the comment section, definitely uh, flooded again with some love uh, for our very own Cecil Wong for all that he has done uh, for us um, just over these past couple of years. Uh, we're very grateful for you and we're, uh, we're thankful for all of your wisdom and love, it, uh, love and care for our families here at CLC. And with that, uh, I'm getting a little hoarse and uh, we're going to kick it on over to Pastor Calvin for a very special intro for our speaker today. Have a great week, everyone. Stay safe and enjoy the sunshine. We'll see you here same time, same place next week. Thank you, Denny. Good morning, CLC family. In a moment, we are going to hear from God's word. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker who is on staff with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, one of the campus ministries our church supports. She's a regional area director in Southern California for graduate and faculty ministries, received her MDiv from Fuller Seminary and ordained by American Baptist churches. She's originally from Chicago and has a heart for global missions and the intergenerational church. Now, a fun fact about, about her, Jana enjoys running as a sport, and not only that, loves helping people find correct fitting running shoes due to her expertise from working at a shoe store while in college. So without further ado, let's welcome Jana Louie as she continues in our Ephesians series, A Whole New World. Jana? Thank you, Pastor Calvin. Good morning, Christian Layman Church. It is such an honor to join you all this morning. Um, even from afar, I'm joining you from Monrovia, California, just outside of LA. And I'm glad to journey with you through this book of Ephesians. And I also can't believe it's already June. Um, it's been a strange year trying to keep track of time uh, through the pandemic, but we find ourselves in the season of transition, as you all have been mentioning. June is typically the season of graduations. I know you all just celebrated your graduates. And it's also the time where the farmer's markets are bustling. We decide on what summer camps will occupy our kids' time during the summer and help us survive the summer. And we're also adjusting to the changes that a year of college has brought when we welcome our students home again. And this year, we have this awkward added layer of finding our way out of Zoom meetings and learning to reorient ourselves to in-person gatherings. I've also been told that your church has been in a season of transition as well, um, in many ways. And with every transition comes anticipation and also grief. Transition always seems to be more exhausting than we'd ever hoped for, and it also brings about some kind of something different than we would have thought. And one theme that I'm noticing lately in my conversations with people transitioning out of the pandemic is that it seems a little bit more exhausting than usual after an ambiguous year of uncertainty. We've settled into new ways of doing life. We've managed, you've made it this far, and there's really no guide about how to return to a reality that we haven't known before. And what I'm noticing is that under these questions about what we should wear when we leave the house and wondering if we should offer a hug, you know, if that's appropriate when we meet someone, is underlying all that is this pervasive social anxiety that we're all feeling. We wonder if we still belong with a group of friends um, or if, we, if we're, our social circles will operate in the same way. And we wonder what our place is in society. 
We wonder what faith looks like when we're relegated to online services that have mostly offered us content for our faith throughout the year. And under these logistics of transition are questions about faith and belonging. And I think the church in Ephesus is also, was also wrestling with these questions of faith and belonging as well. And as we continue in this journey through Ephesians, would you receive these words to a people wrestling with faith, uncertainty, and belonging? So we'll be in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, and I'll be speaking from the CEV version. Therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as a people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort or be very zealous to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit just as God also called you in one hope. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. God has given his grace to each one of us, measured out by the gift that is given by Christ. That's why scripture says when he climbed up to the heights, he captured prisoners and he gave gifts to people. What does the phrase he climbed up mean if it doesn't mean that he had first gone down into the lower regions, the earth? The one who went down is the same one who climbed up above all the heavens so that he might fill everything. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ. And until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's son, God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we aren't supposed to be infants any longer who can be tossed and blown around by every wind that comes from teaching with deceitful scheming and the tricks people play to deliberately mislead others. Instead, by speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from him, and it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with a love as each one does its part. The word of the Lord. See, this passage offers a very idealistic picture of the way the church should be, right? Unified in oneness while also embracing the diversity of gifts and perspectives of those in our community. It's an attractive picture, I think, especially in the U.S., where we take pride in our individuality and in our differences. And this year, I think, has given us more than enough wake-up calls to see that different realities in our society have also made for more fracturing than oneness. See, while we were at home this year, we witnessed George Floyd's murder, the January 6th insurrection, the Atlanta shootings, and countless attacks on our elders. We're no strangers to the pain and the fragmentation of our society. So what do we make of this invitation to oneness while also embracing our diversity? See, if I'm honest, I think the idea of unity and diversity sounds like a nice lofty goal, but my experience, me experience tells me that it's almost impossible. I have this practice of kind of talking with some friends around the world and asking them what they see in the text. And everyone I asked about Ephesians 4 said, well, that's kind of jarring <laughs> and that's kind of strange because I think even for me, after the last four to five years, unity and diversity can sound like this Christian platitude at its best. And it also, or it could sound like washing over painful histories at its worst. And to make matters more complicated, I think history shows us that this phrase unity and diversity has gotten the church on the wrong side of history on many occasions. I think for me, one wake up call to this was I, in 2003, I spent a summer in South Africa where during that summer, we spent one week learning about the history of apartheid. 
And as we began this week of learning, the facilitators asked us to consider this question, what is truth? And I'll be honest, in my pride and defensiveness, my first thoughts were go to scriptures or Christian phrases like, well, Jesus is the truth, obviously. But slowly, as I kind of took in this history, I was completely undone by the week. And it was a jarring experience because we learned that it was actually the Dutch Reformed Church's quest to live out their truth that they saw in scripture and the gospel that birthed and brought forth this oppressive apartheid system in South Africa. And I remember starting to question everything as I came to terms with this reality that the Christian church's teachings created the system of evil and violence. Right? It was justification from scripture that stripped people of their God-given dignity. And that was hard for me to stomach. Because I remember, I, I later did learn that it was the Anglican church that was instrumental in dismantling apartheid. But I was still shaken by this reality that Christian teachings could cause such harm and evil. If you visit the apartheid museum in Johannesburg, which I think you'll see a picture of on the slide there, um, you'll see that the Dutch reform Theologian Abraham Kuyper is credited as one who offered a theological basis for apartheid. And what makes this even more complicated is Kuyper's theology isn't all bad. It's actually brought people to bring about a lot of good in this world. But to be a little bit more specific, some of the biblical basis offered for the apartheid system was that God intended for unity and diversity. Right? The argument was that people are created differently. So therefore people should have different roles in society. Right? In other words, a society can only function in unity and oneness if people play the roles they were intended to play. Right? You hear echoes of that in the latter part of the text that we just heard. So from this biblical basis of unity and diversity, the apartheid system of oppression and segregation was founded. So years after my first visit to South Africa, I entered seminary and took my questions with me. I think there was a part of me that wanted some foolproof way to make sure what I believe or what I taught wouldn't cause this kind of harm. Well, what I learned was even more disturbing, right? Both the church that articulated a biblical basis for apartheid and the church that argued against apartheid talked about this concept of unity and diversity, right? Both churches actually use the same phrases and they use the same ways of interpreting scripture. The only apparent difference that I saw or that it seemed was the church's ability to understand their power and their status as the church in their society. So let me put it in a different way. The Anglican church brought in voices from the black and the colored communities like Desmond Tutu and others to shape their teachings. Whereas the Dutch reformed church held a biblical understanding that was untouched by the people who bore the brunt of their decision. You see, championing unity and diversity from the white community in South Africa meant dictating how and where each community would live and exist in the social order. But unity and diversity for the black and colored communities meant feeding the hungry. It meant sharing resources and it meant advocating for the least of these. See, the difference wasn't in the way that they read the Bible or the words they said. The difference was in their understanding of how the church responds to suffering in society. So what does this have to do with us as we engage in Ephesians 4 today? I think what we learn is that we don't study scripture in a vacuum. We don't engage scripture in a vacuum, but instead our understanding of scripture is shaped by our family stories, by our status and our place in society and the church's current role in our current society. Right, this history invites us to engage this passage courageously by asking hard questions, not shying away from them. And it means us not looking away in the face of painful realities. It means owning up to which side of history we participated in. And I think it means believing people, especially when they've told us or when they tell us they've been hurt by the church. And I'll be honest, this was a pretty difficult passage for me to wrestle with because I've been listening and holding stories of many people who are disillusioned with the church, um, especially in the past few years, from teenagers and young adults to those who have been faithful churchgoers for over five to six decades of their lives. And I think especially these past years, as we've seen the, churches, the US church's relationship in particular with politics and society, 
I think I'm hearing that people are confused about where, how we got to where we are now. We're confused about how the church should respond to the many crises in our world. Because there's a lot and it's overwhelming. And as I hold these stories, I'm tempted to hear this text either as Christian catchphrases or I hear this text with disillusionment from my disappointment with the church. And with this, I want to invite us today to engage with all of your questions, with the grief of transitions, and engage with your hopes for faith and belonging in this next season. And as you welcome your honest questions, feelings, and thoughts, I pray that God's grace would find us and heal us so that we may be God's people together. So today, we find ourselves in a letter to a people who are living in the bustling city of Ephesus. Right? Similar to Los Angeles and San Francisco, Ephesus is a port city that brought in goods from different parts of the world. It was the, the up and coming city for the rich and powerful, setting the tone for Asia Minor. And as far as power and authority goes, Ephesus was a home to Artemis, the Greek goddess of childbirth and nature. And it also claimed Augustus Caesar, an, an emperor, a human emperor, as Lord and God. And part of this was because peace, political peace and stability came through the Pax Romana, and that was attributed to Augustus Caesar. So at every turn and in every picture frame, there were pillars, statues, buildings, and coins to remind you that Augustus Caesar is Lord and is worthy of worship. See, Ephesus is where you go when you wanna make a name for yourself, but you gotta make sure you play by the rules, right? You give honor to Artemis and definitely worship and bow down to Caesar. Otherwise, you might as well pack up and go home because you won't get in the networks that you need to survive. That's Ephesus. So you see, juxtaposed with this alluring epicenter is this small group of Christians that Paul is writing to in Ephesians. In the past months, uh, as you've journeyed through the first three chapters, you've seen the nods to this culture and society through Paul's use of almost over the top words of encouragement to the church in Ephesus. But here in this chapter, there's a switch and we begin to receive guidance and caution from Paul for the small minority community. And it's important to recognize that Paul is writing to a community that is not in the seat of decision-making power. They're not the ones with power here in Ephesus. So it's to the small minority community that Paul says, therefore, as a prisoner for the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you receive from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make every effort to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You see, for a community that's just trying to survive in this harsh world, it seems like a difficult word, doesn't it? Right, living with all humility, gentleness, patience, and love almost sounds like this invitation to weakness and silent obedience. And maybe I think it frustrates me even a little bit more because it almost feels like it's asking for this model minority expression of faith. A faith that somehow seems to be the better way while silencing the injustices of the world around us. I mean, is this really what Paul is asking for from the small minority community, a powerless community in Ephesus? Is he asking for a passive faith in the name of grace? See, though I'm often attuned to the complex realities that come with being an Asian American woman in the US. One piece I've been aware of or learning to grow in is that I'm often unaware of the privileges that come with being a Christian in the, in the US. It usually takes conversations with friends who live as religious minorities around the world to even see and understand my privilege as a Christian. The years ago, I spent time with friends and colleagues in Malaysia where they don't have the privilege of religious liberty. My friends would go to great lengths to explain that religion, race, and politics were interconnected. I think you're seeing a slide of one of the rallies um, asking that uh, for corruption to be um, rid from their, uh, from their elections and from their government. And so my friends would talk about how they're constantly running into the limits of their rights as Christians in their homeland. And as I heard story after story about how Christ, being a Christian meant somehow accepting that they're less than others, right? Because of laws, policies, or, or, and so on, 
I asked an honest question to a friend of mine. I asked, how do you maintain hope when fighting for your rights? Simple question in my mind. And my friend just replied, well, sometimes the most Christian thing to do isn't to fight for your own rights, but to fight for the rights of others. And his response has stayed with me because I realized a few things. First, I realized how right-centric I am as a US Christian. And it's not that I don't believe in having rights and I'm not grateful for my rights and grateful for the privileges afforded to us. But what I mean is that I can often confuse having rights with having dignity. So having rights doesn't equate and doesn't bring about someone having dignity. My friend's response was calling me to a different way of belonging that dignified myself, my community, and others. And as I thought about my friend's response, I realized also how I often have this limited imagination for how to follow Jesus in this world. What I learned from my friend's response is that humility, gentleness, patience, and love look very different than I think, right? Humility isn't this false sense of pride that rejects any kind of affirmation that comes our way, right? Humility is the absence of envy, right? Which allows us to see ourselves and one another as God sees us. Gentleness isn't weakness, but gentleness is choosing not to surrender to the violent ways of this world. And patience isn't passivity, but it, it is at faithful and active confession that Jesus is Lord in this broken world. So for a church in Ephesus, choosing humility, gentleness, and patience is declaring that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar and not Artemis, right? Who needs statues, pillars, and temples. See, when Caesar is on the coins and the pillars of society, Jesus' way of love is even more powerful. Humility, gentleness, patience, and love offer us a way forward as a community that actually subverts the harsh and violent ways of this world. So instead of playing by the rules of Ephesus, Paul is offering the church a really different way of being together in this world, right? The way of humility, of gentleness, patience, and love. That way gives agency to God's people to create a different way of being in this world. You see, my friends, in a city full of social media influencers who paint this grandiose picture of an unattainable life, God's people are called to choose humility to see themselves as God sees them, nothing more and nothing less. In a city that champions second amendment rights in the name of self-protection, God's people are to choose gentleness, a way that doesn't hunger for power, but lifts up the vulnerable. And in a city full of trend setting tech companies that seem endlessly powerful, God's people are to choose the way of love and of patience, the way of faithfulness that's unseen and at home in the shadows. And the invitation to all humility, gentleness, patience, and love isn't a passive call for God's people. It's the radical way of being followers of Jesus in a world that yearns for power. You see, the faith that we belong to Jesus, a confession that challenges the powers around us, no matter how consuming they seem to be, it's that kind of faith. Jesus' way reminds us that though God is over all, through all, and in all, Jesus still chooses to descend in order to ascend. You see, this isn't a passive call, but it's one that offers agency to God's people. And as a minority community, maybe like more like Muslims in the U.S. than Christians, they're used to being scapegoats for Roman society. But this isn't a call for them to put their heads down and just stay silent. But it's a call to remember that Christ's way is counterintuitive to the ways of this world, right? Paul's instructions to, are to the community of believers in Ephesus. So they're together to embody this way of humility, gentleness, patience, and love. You see, their resistance to the pressures of Ephesian society is their way of being together. So to have faith in Jesus is to choose the way of going down because that's the way of going up. Power is not found in hoarding and keeping it for ourselves or, or so that we have influence, but it's found in the way of gentleness and of patience. 
And when they're prone to hopelessness in this all-consuming empire, they find belonging as they love one another. To survive this harsh world is to choose this way of Jesus. I think transitions hold a lot of grief and it makes space for grief, but transitions also provide space for reflection. When we celebrate, when we honor those who are leaving us in our community or different things or, or, or loss even, we also look back with nostalgia. Right? We tell stories that have been forgotten, we remember and we celebrate. And with every story, I think we become aware of these narratives that shape our community. There's a tenderness as we share stories and we celebrate that sometimes feels even too sacred to share and a little bit too vulnerable to offer when we feel unsafe because transition can feel ambiguous. But I wonder how might God be inviting CLC into the way of Jesus as you hold your community's tender stories in this time? Maybe it means reflecting on how CLC has been a community of humility, gentleness, patience and love in the midst of a really broken society. And then from there, I wonder if it might invite your CLC community and your family to consider where might you have unintentionally mimicked the culture of our society? And from that place of remembering and maybe of grief, how might God be inviting the CLC family to embody a different way of being together in our broken world? You see, I'm the type of person who can sometimes be lost in my thinking about big picture realities. My good friends know that I can be somewhat of a sad soul, especially when I'm reminded of the pain and the brokenness in our world. And as I mentioned before, the last years have been a wake up call in many ways for the US church because we've really broken trust with our society and, and throughout uh, generations um, leading us to this point. And unlike the church in Ephesus, we aren't the powerless in our society, but we've often actually sided with the political powers of our country. And as I read more news articles or watch different documentary, it's easy for me to consider what I hope for the church to be. So that's where my mind kind of wanders and goes. But almost if, if, as if to keep us grounded, Paul reminds the church in Ephesus that we all play a part in this community. Though they're a powerless they're powerless as a community in their society. God's grace is given to each person in the community. And again, they're reminded that they aren't just passive participants in this minority community, but they're given unique roles as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers so that they may be a community of humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Right? God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. They're not to be like children who are just influenced by the world around them or this consuming empire that is Ephesus. But instead, as they use their God-given gifts, they remind each other of the community that they're meant to be. I mean, let's be honest, being in community is hard. I mean, unless you wanna stay on a surface level, there's always infighting, right? We're people. And everyone has their different opinions on who's in and who's out. And there are those who always have a little bit more influence or more influence in the community. And then there are those who've accepted that they're just on the fringe of the community. They've accepted their fringe status. And yet the invitation here is to consider your place in the community, whether you're someone with an official position or you're someone who's still trying to figure out your place. And maybe the invitation here isn't for a picture perfect church, but one that wrestles with the complexities of different gifts and perspectives. Maybe the invitation is to have humility to embrace your God-given gifts, but also humility to acknowledge when the way you have used your gift has hurt others. Maybe it's the invitation to be gentle and patient when we wanna move the church towards a certain direction, but others are still in pain. CLC family, as you continue in the season of grief and hope, may God give you the grace to love one another well. May you have the courage to speak truth with complete honesty and be gentle to listen deeply to one another. 
And in this new season, may you be a community where the world can see the way of Christ's love in your community together. My friends, I don't think the world is looking for a picture perfect church or a perfect church. We're well past that. But I do think the world is looking for a church that follows in the way of Christ's love. A love that has the humility to say when we're wrong. A love that has the gentleness to hold deep pain in the church and outside. And a love that has the patience to be faithful in God's work of peace, even when we aren't recognized. A love that offers radical belonging to a community in transition. May God hold and sustain CLC in this journey. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, we do thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you've been trustworthy in all these years of CLC's life. God, we also recognize that there's pain and grief in transition. Um, and I just pray that even in this time of transition, would you in your patient love hold the sadness and the grief and also the hope together. God, we pray that even as CLC discerns this next season and this next journey, step of this journey, we pray God that you would, would you give the CLC family wisdom and discernment uh, to reflect well and to hold the stories of the past well, but God, would you also give them discernment about what it means to be a community of humility, gentleness, patience and love in this world. God, we pray that CLC would be a place of radical belonging, one that subverts the powers of the world around us. God, that you might be seen, Jesus, that you might be seen as Lord and King. So God, the one who holds our grief, the one who holds our joy, would you hold together our grief and our celebration, our longings and our hope? We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks so much, Jana. Um, what, a, what a great word as we come to communion. Um, how do we, um, how do we uh, as a church and as a, uh, as a group of brothers and sisters um, express our faith to one another and to the community God's placed us in? And so as we, uh, um, as we come to communion together, uh, first, would you take a second to gather the elements if you already haven't done so this morning um, to do communion? And then um, uh, as, we, uh, as we take communion together, this is the picture that Jesus has given us uh, uh, in, in the, the picture that you've painted, Jenna, of, of what really it means to be, uh, to be uh, unified. Um, you know, I always think how beautiful it is that this morning all over the world, uh, brothers and sisters of, from, from so many different cultures, um, from Russia to Brazil to uh, South America uh, to different tribes in Africa, will be celebrating communion and it will have the exact same meaning as it does for us. It's also timeless. Um, our, uh, our ancestors, family, 50, 100 years ago, communion meant the same thing to them. Um, 500 years ago, communion held the same picture of Jesus' um, broken body and spilled blood covering um, our sin and freeing us uh, to, uh, to uh, be able to walk and live with him. And so let's take a moment and focus and remember Jesus in his sacrifice and then we'll receive communion together. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 4, I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together.
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. And Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your sacrificial death, that you having all power laid down all of it to come and to be with us. We know that we have standing with, with you because of your death, because that you obey the Father. So thank you, Father. Thank you so much. And as we go throughout our week, um, we ask, Father, that you go before us, that uh, the thoughts that we heard this morning from Jana, that your word would dwell in us richly, that in a world that is uh, often um, confusing, and uh, as we've come through this difficult year, we ask that you would give us clarity. And Holy Spirit, would you keep us focused on, on this sort of humility that you, dis that you displayed uh, not only to us, but for us? And might we draw on that as the energy to live as people that belong to you? Thank you, Father. Thank you for this morning. And we ask that we ask all of these things in your powerful and precious name. Amen. Now, as we've just um, celebrated communion, we actually get to celebrate uh, the other um, ordinance uh, sacrament of baptism in a second with Pastor Ben. But let me remind you of a few things before we transition to, uh, uh, to baptism. The first one is... Um, we will have our weekly social hall happening right after the service, and that uh, Zoom ID should be popping up any time now, uh, as if by magic. Um, also, uh, at one o'clock, we have our annual uh, meeting. And so today is communion, baptism. It's, it's a trifecta. It's the Christian rule of three um, that uh, we will um, uh, get, to, uh, get to hear all the things that happen. And I was so greatly encouraged as a new pastor here at the church, to hear everything uh, that uh, that transpired during uh, the pandemic and all the things that so many of you did. And so uh, I think it'll be a time of real encouragement um, as you uh, uh, as, as you uh, hopefully can attend our annual meeting today at one on Zoom. Anyways, well, without further ado, we have standing by, I believe, live, uh, Pastor Ben, and uh, uh, let's go to let's go to the baptism. Hello, church family. This is Pastor Ben, live from um, the pool at Chris and Deanna's house in Wana Creek. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but today we have a very, very special treat as we're baptizing Justin Yao. Um, as you guys know that um, baptism is a public confession of, of our faith and the commitment to live for Jesus Christ. As we are submerged in underwater, that we are dead to sin. As we come out of, we are alive with Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today, as we're going to be baptizing Justin Yao, who is actually a member of the Tikva home group, who I've been actually had to acknowledge or to have a, a friendship for the last 10 months. And so before we actually go through the baptism, I wanted to give the mic over to Justin to give a short testimony before the baptism itself. Uh, hello, yeah, so my journey started um, when I was younger. I was growing up in a Christian family, got brought to church, um, and was exposed to it pretty early on. Um, I would say, though, for a lot of my time there and throughout high school, uh, I spent a lot of time kind of 
going through this a little bit as a chore sometimes, but um, trying to think about it from a logical rationalization perspective. Um, and I think at the end of the day, uh, tried to take in the words as like knowledge or as textbook or history as our philosophy. So struggled a lot uh, when I was younger in terms of really understanding if this was, you know, capital T truth, if this was something I was to believe in, um, but didn't have much of a relationship back then. Um, and so kind of was on the fence. Um, and I think what really changed when going to college was taking a step to actually engage in a relationship. Um, a lot of my high school days, I think I was trying to rationalize why a God existed, why Jesus was that God, um, and saw a lot of misses actually in my own life in terms of spending time outside of church, out of study, out of worship, to just think about it for myself. Um, and then in college, came across the Christian Fellowship uh, called CBS. Uh, spent a lot of time there with you know, a lot of brothers and sisters thinking about it. Um, and I think my whole journey, there wasn't any particularly pivotal met, uh, moment in time when I could say like, bam, I became a believer. But there was one time, uh, sophomore year at our winter retreat when we had um, a pastor come and, and speak about God's love. And what stood out particularly to me during that time was he preached about how his church had these things called missional action groups. Um, and the way that they believed in God's love was sort of going out and serving and reaching people where they were met, um, as opposed to trying to bring them into the church. Um, and it wasn't that particular example that I would say, like, maybe become Christian, but it was, it was like a flick of a switch that happened inside of me where I think I realized I had been thinking about it a, a pretty wrong in terms of what God's love was. I think I had thought about it from a self-improvement perspective. I thought about it from a, you know, adhering to the teachings, but that one really made me think about how, you know, because we were loved, how we could be filled and then go out and, you know, really be selfless with other people. So I think since that particular moment in time, it has been a journey in, you know, how do I learn more and grow more, turn it from something that's in my head into my heart. Um, and then since college, really, how do I not just compartmentalize this as to like, back then it was a Christian fellowship I was involved in or as a part of my life, but how is this my full identity? Um, it's been up and downs, you know, since leaving college where you have such high tangible um, community uh, of folks that were so close living in and living out. Um, but through my days in SF with Epic and, and now at CLC and with the, the Tikva optometry group, um, it, it's just been, you know, a long journey into understanding how to, how the number one identity in me is through Christ. Um, and th that's not just like a, I go to church and then I go do work. That's really a, I believe in Christ and therefore, you know, everything flows from that. Um, so that brings us here today. Um, there was a part of me that thought at one point or another that to become baptized, I would be like on fire or something or, you know, hashtag burning desire. Um, but, you know, I stand before you today, you know, feeling really at peace, I would say, not, not particularly on fire. Um, but I think that just means that, you know, I have absolute conviction here today that what I believe here is the truth and what I believe here I can you know, through thick and thin is something that I will proclaim to follow and, and proclaim to do for the rest of my life. So um, thank you so much uh, for my parents. Uh, <laughs> we had many conversations about me getting baptized, and I know I've not really shared that much, but hopefully today was <laughs> a good story and a good start. Um, and thanks to, you know, my CBS family, my Epic family, uh, CLC, um, and everyone others, you know, in between. Um, at work and, and elsewhere who have challenged me and, and, and poked me to be like, do you really believe, you know, what about this and holding me accountable? Um, so yeah, that's my testimony. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, you, you know, um, I've actually known um, Justin uh, within 10 months uh, as we're going through um, marriage counseling. But you know what? For that 10 months, I've actually seen him grow and mature. And when he actually asked, hey, you know what, Pastor Ben, can, can I get baptized? Um, all the pastoral staff were like, yes, because you know what? I really believe that uh, one of the significance of a sign that a church is alive I believe one of the one of the indicators is is that we baptize. And so today, uh, as we baptize um, Justin, I want all of us, all the CLC members, all the uh, members at CLC to be able to be partakers and to join in uh, as we baptize uh, Justin. So, Justin, um, before I baptize you, I'm going to ask you three questions. And so um, you answer. So first question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? And do you have uh, do you have the assurance that that he is the, your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Okay. And secondly, uh, Justin, uh, do you have the assurance that God has forgiven you from all the sins and that you desire to walk with him in this newness of this life? Yes. And finally, uh, Justin, in the fellowship and the communion of the church, do you desire uh, to do God's will? and obediently to do the holy commandment that he has given to you to, to be able to go to the kingdom of God and to ends of the earth. I do. Okay. So with that, uh, I want to pray for Justin before we uh, baptize him. And so would you guys, all of us who are watching live, would you just uh, pray with us? Father God, we thank you so very much uh, for the life that you've hold in Justin's life uh, from, from the beginning. And now he's ready to make a public declaration. I, I just pray, Father Lord, that we as the family would watch and we'd be able to really encourage and edify, Father Lord, as we walk alongside of Justin. Father God, I am so encouraged for the past 10 months as I, as I watch Justin walk in you, how he has matured. And, he, you know, even though he says that he's not fired up, but I saw, saw Father Lord, that just bringing newness into life of his life, Father God, that you brought. And Father God, as we baptize him today, not only in this place, but also all of us who are watching, Father God, help us to partake of as a, a whole community and as us part of this, uh, this life of, of believers at CLC as well. Father God, once again, we bless um, Justin. Uh, we we, uh, we want to really, really encourage and edify in Justin's life as well. Father God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, upon the confession that you have made, Justin, and the willingness to obediently follow in God's will, I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's actually a lot of his uh, friends and members of his uh, home group. Come on over. Come on over. They want to they wanna congratulate. They want to celebrate with him. So would you guys, all of you guys who are watching too, would you guys give a round of applause? Hoopla, yeah. You, you, you could go, go, go over there and go over there, go over there. All right, all right, all right. Hey, thank you, CLC for joining us in this really, really kind of an epic uh, of baptizing someone. Hope you guys have a great week, and I hope to see you guys next week. See you guys later. Bye.